Hi, everyone. This is AJ Woodhams, host of the War Books podcast, where I interview today's best authors writing about war-related topics. Uh, today, I am really excited to have John Lyle on the show for his new book, The Dirty Tricks Department, Stanley Lavelle, The OSS, and the Masterminds of World War II Secret Warfare. John Lyle is a historian of science in the American intelligence community. He earned a PhD in history from the University of Texas and has taught courses on U.S. history, cyberspace, and information warfare. His writing has appeared in Scientific American, Smithsonian Magazine, Skeptic, The Journal of Intelligence History, and Physics in Perspective. John, how are you today? I'm great. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about this book. Thanks for having me. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, me too. And you know, thanks for coming on the show. I know this is your first book, so congratulations uh, on that. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been working on it while I was in grad school and kind of finishing up after I got my PhD. And so it, it, it really is not, not just a relief, but exciting to put it out there in the world because I feel like, man, I've been working on this for so long and now I'm getting yeah. to see people's reactions and see them enjoy it. So that's been a lot of fun. Yeah, well, I mean, and so I'm not, um, I'm not, I'm not a published author myself yet, but hopefully one day. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, writing's like it's a little bit different than you know, like writing a novel or writing a book is different than like writing music. You don't get like that instant gratification, but when it's all done and you like, you know, you hold it in your hands, um, you know, I, uh, I, I, I can see um, why mm -hmm. that would be uh, you know, exciting to you now. Um, so yeah, congratulations, I, you know, I can. I, I sympathize with that idea of the instant gratification because writing this, um, I, you know, I would write drafts of chapters and read over it. And, you know, this, this took many years and I, I, I've edited this dozens of times. And every time I would edit a chapter, I would think, you know, it, there's not that instant gratification because I think, oh, I, I can do this section a little better. I can do this a little better. And every time I read through it, I thought, oh, this can be a little bit better. But it was gratifying at the very end because I thought, well, wow, I have progressed so much in my writing ability just by going over this and learning nice. that was really fun to see my own personal progression through editing this so much yeah i mean that can be a real trap though too is like always saying oh this can be better this can be better uh, <laughs> yeah. i've i've found myself saying that probably too many times um well what made you want to write this book john i had learned of some of the stories that are in this book um from several different places and i didn't realize that they were really connected so some of the some of the big stories in this book have to do with like bat bombs during World War II, strapping incendiary napalm devices to bats. Other stories have to do with glowing foxes released in Japan, or all kinds of these interesting schemes, forged documents, camouflage disguises, truth drugs. And I had heard of a lot of separate parts of this book from several different sources, and I never really connected them in my mind. I just thought, oh, that's an interesting scheme that happened during World War II. But it was while I was writing my dissertation in grad school at UT that I came across this figure of Stanley Lovell. He was the head of this uh, branch of the OSS that, that I kind of write about. And Stanley Lovell was the character that connected all of these interesting stories. And so when I realized, oh, these are all part of the story, it's all part of Stanley Lovell's story, that's when I thought, well, this is too good not to write about. You know, So Thanks. I was writing my dissertation on a different topic and I found this topic with Stanley Lovell, and I thought, well, in my spare time, I've got to write about this because I just, it's, it's a hobby. Like, I can't put it down at this point. So that's how I kind of got into yeah. it. It was too good of a story not to want to write about. And, you know, I can definitely see how, how the gears would start turning because some of the stories are just wild. Uh, it's just, it's, it's really just crazy. Uh, so Stanley Lovell, uh, he's head of the R&D department at the OSS, mm -hmm. which we'll get into. Um, but... Uh, the dirty tricks uh, that are described in your book, I thought were were wild and bananas and crazy. Um, how did you get interested in in intelligence history, um, specifically World War II intelligence history? Mm -hmm. I, th I think uh, that mostly does go to when I was in grad school and getting my PhD. Um, I was writing my dissertation on a group of American scientists called the Science Attachés. Uh, these are kind of diplomat scientists who were sent abroad by the State Department to different embassies. And I started realizing that they had really deep connections with the CIA and the intelligence community. And so that understanding that connection is kind of what got me interested in scientists in the intelligence community 
And from there, I kind of learned about these stories. So that's kind of the genesis of my interest in the topic. And then, yeah, it, it, I had further interest, I guess, in the specific individuals when I learned about them. Well, uh, let's dive actually into, um, we'll start with the OSS, the Office of Strategic mm-hmm. Services. That's mm-hmm. correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what was this office? Um, what were the circumstances around which it was created? Yeah, the OSS, it's easy to think of it kind of as the precursor to the CIA. So during World War II, there wasn't a CIA. Instead, there was the OSS. It was the United States' centralized intelligence organization. The purpose of it was to gather intelligence from abroad, either by sources or spies or something like that, um, have uh, people back in the United States who would analyze that intelligence. And the idea is to inform the president of everything that's going on. Um, Before the OSS, there there, there were still intelligence kind of agencies in the United States, most notably associated with the military branches. So there was, you know, army intelligence, naval intelligence. But... William Donovan, that, who, who would become head of the OSS, he really advocated for President Franklin Roosevelt to create a centralized intelligence organization so that each of these independent organizations aren't duplicating each other's research, um, aren't uh, spending kind of unnecessary funds. He, he wanted one place that would uh, gather all of that intelligence together and analyze it and inform the president and have the most accurate, up-to-date information possible. So that's the idea behind the OSS. And so this is uh, 1940? Yes, yes. Um, 1940. The, the, uh, it really starts right after Pearl Harbor. So in early 1940. Okay. Uh, so right 41. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, but, but before, before Pearl Harbor, there was kind of an organization called the COI, the Coordinator of Information. And it's kind of the brief precursor to the OSS, but right after, right in 1942, it becomes the OSS. So right in that time period. And so, um, what was, so one of the things that, so the OSS is this, um, it's this very new branch. Um, obviously this is, you know, Pearl Harbor, America's at war. Um, the OSS at first kind of has a, a, I don't know if bad reputation is the right word, but you put, you, you say in your book, it was, um, uh, it was mocked as oh, so social, um, yeah, yeah. Uh, for what OSS stood for. Why was that? And and talk about the types of people in the OSS. Yeah, that was kind of the common derogatory name that people would associate with OSS instead of Office of Strategic Services, oh, so social, or some variant of that. The idea being a lot of people, especially in the military, kind of looked down on the OSS because if you join the OSS, you might not get deployed, you know, so you, you might not be deployed to Europe. And so this was kind of seen as a way to avoid the draft. Uh, and so it was commonly, it, so, sometimes it was called, the, said that the OSS handed out cellophane commissions, the idea being that they were transparent. So it's obvious you're trying to avoid the draft. And then it kept the draft off like, you know, cellophane. Um, so the idea with this oh so social uh, moniker is that the OSS recruited a lot of people from really kind of highfalutin, aristocratic, uh, you know, Ivy League backgrounds. So a typical saying about the people who worked in the OSS, at least at the beginning, was that they were pale, male, and Yale. <laughs> nice. Yeah, so that, that really nice. some monikers about it. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, let's let's actually. You mentioned William Donovan before we get into Stanley Lovell. Um, now William Donovan has also has the nickname of being Wild Bill Donovan. Uh, mm-hmm. so, so, you know, like what's, you know, things will ensue, um, in your book called the dirty tricks, um, talk real quick about, um, William Donovan. Yeah. Donovan is a world war one war hero. He earned the medal of honor in world war one. One of the most decorated soldiers during the war for the United States. He was a lawyer afterwards, and he actually ran to succeed Franklin Roosevelt as governor of New York, he lost, but he was fairly tight with Roosevelt, even though they were from different political parties. In the 1930s, Roosevelt sent Donovan abroad kind of as an, a special envoy to try to see what the situation was in Europe. So Donovan is traveling around Europe trying to gauge what the tensions are like, and he comes back and informs President Roosevelt of what he sees. Um, the main thing he informs him of is that he thinks 
there needs to be a dedicated organization that does just what Donovan did, that sends people abroad and understands the foreign situation. This is kind of the genesis of the OSS. But Donovan is a, well, his nickname, as he said, is Wild Bill Donovan. And he certainly has the character to match that nickname. He's very gung-ho. You know, he wants to be in the action. He had been shot by a machine gun during World War I. He survived. And he can't help himself for wanting to be basically on the front lines again. He kind of had war in his blood. Um, so, you know, there's a story in the book. I get to D-Day, Normandy, and the storming of these beaches. Donovan wants to be in it to the point where he actually does. He, you know, he's, he's the head of the OSS, but he can't stop himself from trying to get involved in the action somehow. So he, he storms the beaches on the second day of, of this Normandy invasion. And he gets shot at by Germans. He almost has to commit suicide with a suicide pill because he's afraid that they're going to catch him and he doesn't want to have to divulge, you know, secret information. So that is definitely his personality. Wild Bill is a fitting name for him. Yeah, I remember reading that in the book. I believe he also is uh, like the image in my mind wasn't it was it was. So he also gets when he gets off the boat, he gets like jabbed in the neck, right? By some guy who falls on him. So he's like bleeding. Yeah, yeah. He doesn't acknowledge it. <laughs> yeah, he is. He's with a, a companion who's, you know, accompanying it kind of his right man, right hand man in the OSS, David Bruce. And as they're getting off the boat um, on, onto the beaches, Bruce slips and his helmet gashes Donovan right in the throat next to the jugular. So Donovan is like bleeding on the beach and he gets up and he tells David Bruce, if we're going to die, I want to be buried in Arlington National Cemetery. That's all he says. And then they continue on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I wonder, too. I bet he is buried in Arlington National Cemetery. I, yes. I, yes, I, he yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then in the when they're when they're about to get caught, too, um, I, I think I think this is in the chapter um, about um, poison pills. And mm-hmm. uh, one of the two is supposed to bring the pills with them, but they don't have them. And so Bill Donovan's like, well, I guess we'll just have, I'll just have to shoot you uh, or something yeah. like that. And he's like, I'm your commanding officer. So I'll shoot you first and then I'll shoot myself. I'm like, yeah, wow, that, what that, that was an interesting case right there because he and David Bruce are being shot at by some German sentries and they had to duck under some bushes, you know, so they're trying to escape being shot at by these bullets. And Donovan is searching around his pockets for his L pill, a lethal pill, a cyanide kind of suicide pill that the R&D branch that I talk about in this book had manufactured. And he's searching and he can't find it. And, you know, he kind of makes a joke and, you know, as if this is the proper time to joke, but he says, well, if, you know, if we make it out of here, we got to tell the, you know, the kind of porter who's working in the hotel not to take any of those pills because he's worried he'll grab them. But anyways, Donovan says to David Bruce, "Um, I'll shoot first. And at first, David Bruce takes this as, you know, I'll shoot at the Germans first so that you can run away and then you give me cover. You know, I'll give you cover, you give me cover. And David Bruce says, well, we're going to shoot at them with our pistols. That's not going to do much. And Donovan says, no, you're mistaking me. I'll shoot you first and then I'll kill myself. You know, as your commanding officer, that's my duty. But eventually they were able to make it out and run away. So they didn't have to you know, commit suicide, but it was on the menu. Yeah, and I I really enjoy those the the stories, uh, the anecdotes like that that are in your your book. There's several of them. Um, let's 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 pivot real quick to uh, Stanley Lovell, who really takes center stage in your book. Obviously, his name is is on the cover. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, talk a little bit about Stanley Lovell. Who was he? What was his background? And what kind of person was he? Lovell is um, a chemist from New England. He is before the war, just working in several different shoe and leather factories. So not kind of a profession that you would think would lend to this kind of creating of these dirty tricks. But he was fairly close with a man named Vannevar Bush. Vannevar Bush was he, uh, uh, an electrical engineer, but he was kind of the unofficial uh, science advisor to President Roosevelt. So he had really high contacts and high place. Um, Vannevar Bush is the man who kind of coordinated wartime scientific research for the United States during World War II. He was overall kind of um, the person that anyone would report to as the head of like the Manhattan Project or developing radar or proximity fuses or anything like that. So Stanley Lovell knew Vannevar Bush. They were both from kind of around Boston. Vannevar Bush during the war kind of recruits Stanley Lovell. Lovell becomes an aide for Bush. And then Bush eventually recommends that Lovell join the OSS. One of the reasons he did this was because Stanley Lovell had a background in both business and science, and 
he thought that he could kind of bring a level-headed perspective to the OSS. Remember, this is at the time when the OSS has kind of that um, that patina of being overly, I don't know, pale male in Yale and, you know, all that kind of stuff, oh so social. So uh, Bush thought that Stanley Lovell would really discipline the OSS. So Stanley Lovell goes to meet with Donovan to potentially get a job there. And William Donovan says to Stanley Lovell, I want you to become my Professor Moriarty. This is being an allusion to, you know, the, the bad guy in the Sherlock Holmes novel, Professor Moriarty. And, you know, Donovan tells Lovell, I want you to create all the dirty tricks that are going to be needed to win this war against the Germans and the Japanese. And so that's how Lovell gets recruited into the OSS. And particularly, he is assigned to head a, a specific branch of the OSS that deals with creating weapons, documents, and disguises for all of the OSS agents that are going to be sent abroad. This branch becomes called the, the Research and Development Branch, the R&D branch, uh, what the title of this book refers to, the Dirty Tricks Department. So this is really what the book is about. That's how Stanley Lovell becomes the head of it. And Stanley Lovell, so kind of contrasting him to to Bill Donovan, you know, nobody calls Stanley, you know, Wild Stanley. Um, you know, what was what was his personality? He he seemed a little bit more tame. Um, talk a bit about the kind of person he was. Yeah, so that's one of the major arcs of this book is watching Stanley Lovell develop throughout the course of this war. At the beginning of the war, he's kind of a shy scientist. I mean, that's what he is, and he wants to use his scientist, his science before the war for good. He was, he was basically an orphan. Both of his parents died when he was very young. The rest of his family wouldn't take him in. And his older sister, who was only older by a few years, she basically raised him. She was a seamstress and she paid for his schooling and all kinds of stuff. And so he was basically orphaned from a young age. But he got this great education and he felt indebted to his country. Like he owed a personal debt to it because it allowed this orphaned boy to get such a great education. And so he had this personal conflict. He wanted to use his scientific expertise to help people. He kind of had like a Hippocratic obligation. I need to help people and do something good. But at the same time, the way to help his country at this particular moment in time was to develop deadly weapons, or at least he's recruited to. So he has kind of this personal conflict of what to do. He actually meets with William Donovan and he says, I don't know if I feel comfortable doing this. I don't know if I feel comfortable becoming the head of this R&D branch. And Donovan tells him to basically grow up, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll even do it. <laughs> and that's basically what happens. Lovell becomes the head of this branch. And throughout the course of the war, you really see his, his moral, intellectual, uh, personal development. By the end of the war, Stanley Lovell, this guy who is at first so reluctant to be involved in deadly weapons, is advocating for the United States to use basically weapons of mass destruction, biological weapons, chemical weapons, the atomic bomb. So you really see his moral arc throughout this story, and that's one of the main things I wanted to try to draw out. Yeah, and uh, I uh, later on in the interview, I want to ask you about kind of the moral dilemma. Specifically, mm -hmm. I was I was struck by that with uh, with Stanley Lovell, um, particularly particularly when you get to the part about biological weapons and, and chemical weapons. Mm -hmm. Um, but before, before we explore the moral dimension, let's actually talk about, uh, some of these tricks, um, yeah. because, um, you know, they were, there's just, they're just cool stories. Um, so first let's, let's just talk about just like the crazy ones, just like some, some of the really wild ones. Um, what, what were some of the craziest tricks that the OSS tried? Mm -hmm. The two that that immediately spring to mind whenever we're talking about like outlandish kind of stuff that's going on in this R&D branch involve both involve animals and I kind of mentioned them before bat bombs and glowing foxes so I can briefly kind of describe what are bat bombs and glowing foxes um, the idea with a bat bomb had actually sprang from a dentist who had taken a trip to Carlsbad Caverns right before Pearl Harbor and then after Pearl Harbor he was thinking how he can help his country you know the United States defeat the Japanese well, he had just been to Carlsbad Caverns, which are these caverns in New Mexico, home to millions of Mexican free tail bats. And he realized, what if we, this, this guy's name is Little Adam. And he thought, what if we capture bats, we strap onto them incendiary devices that blow up and start fires, and we release the bats in Japan. The bats will then roost in buildings and warehouses and everything. And then if there's a time delay on the explosives, then the explosives will blow up after a predetermined time. And it will catch fire to all these buildings. 
So instead of sending a costly bomber raid that drops bombs and probably isn't going to hit the target anyway, we can have these bats that are basically like heat-seeking missiles. They'll go right to the houses to roost in them, and then it'll blow them up and set fire. That's the genesis of this idea. Now, it, on the surface of it, it already seems outlandish, but the way that this actually got into production was that Little Adams happened to be a personal acquaintance of Eleanor Roosevelt, the first lady of the United States. And she passed his proposal on to Franklin Roosevelt. He passed it on to William Donovan of the OSS. And there's a note appended to the proposal that, that FDR wrote to Donovan that says, this man is not a nut. Listen to what he has to say. <laughs> and so Donovan, of course, he handed this proposal to the one branch of the OSS capable of actually carrying it out, the R&D branch. And so that's how it falls into Stanley Lovell's hands. And there are several experiments um, that go along with this bat bomb project. These bats are literally captured from their caves. They go and swing giant nets and capture a bunch of lots of bats. And to create an incendiary device for the bats, Stanley Lovell hires a chemist from Harvard named Louis Pfizer. He, Louis Pfizer was the inventor of napalm right before the war. So his kind of reputation preceded him. And Lovell hires him. He develops a really small incendiary device that he can attach to these little bats. They do several tests with this. So in one test, they, they cool these bats kind of in a refrigerator. The idea being they're going to put them in an artificial hibernation state. And that's how they're going to transport them to Japan. So they put them in this kind of artificial hibernative state. They fly them up in a plane and they release them. The idea being, we'll see if they can wake up and, you know, kind of fly off and see what happens. Well, it turns out they had cooled them down too much and the bats just kind of crashed into the desert ground. So that, that didn't work as planned. Yeah, when Fyder things go wrong, to... when things go wrong, I found <laughs> is some of the, the more interesting stories from your book. Uh, but yes, anyway, and go that, ahead. That, yeah, the, the second experiment with this goes even more horribly wrong because in the second experiment, Louis Pfizer attaches actual incendiary devices to these bats. Well, they ended up, instead of waking up, they, not waking up, they woke up too soon. So some of the bats flew off before they were ready, and they had these incendiary devices strapped to them. So they flew into a nearby barracks, into a control tower, and they actually blew it up. So the bat bomb actually kind of worked. So, uh, yeah. It's crazy. It, it, actually, it eventually wasn't deployed during the war. This was the, the research for it and the development of these the bat bombs was happening toward the end of the war. By that time, the atomic bomb had already been developed, so these aren't deployed, but it was certainly worked on. Well, what, something that really struck me when I was reading this story in the book was that, and you know, hindsight now is, is 2020. And so, you know, we can sit here and be like, oh my gosh, like, what were they thinking? That's so dumb. Um, how could, how could anybody ever, ever possibly think that that could work? But something that really struck me that you write about is the bat bomb guys who were developing this. Um, they were kind of thinking about all the crazy, the crazy things that, that, that were, were being experimented with. And what they think is craziest of all are some scientists who have this bizarre notion that you could split an atom and create a bomb. And they're like, no, 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 no. Like, that's nuts. Like, we need to work on the bat bombs. Like, that's, that's going to win exactly. us the war. <laughs> yeah. both, both of these projects are happening in New Mexico, a, a large part of the testing. You know, the atomic bomb, um, that's being developed at Los Alamos in New Mexico. And these bat bombs, the bats are being captured from New Mexico and some of these tests are happening there. And so that's exactly right. Little Adams, the guy who had come up with the, who come up with, came up with the idea of the bat bomb, he was talking to some general trying to get funding. And the general was saying, you know, um, we're already funding so many scientific projects. I don't know if we can do it for the bat bomb. Little Adams comes back to New Mexico mad. And he says, basically, I can't understand why they're bothering, funding, messing around with these little atoms when we have a really good thing like the bat bomb here. This is the thing that's going to win the war. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was, uh, again, you know, 2020 is hindsight because at the time, it, it would be ludicrous to think that. Yeah. that well, this, you know. this, this is a good point that I try to bring out in the book that I want to use historical empathy. I want to be able to situate the reader within the mindset of these people and try to understand I mean, from, from our perspective, it looks kind of outlandish, some of these projects. Some of them aren't outlandish. I mean, some of them are very practical and useful. But like the bat bomb, that seems kind of outlandish. But, you know, one of the goals I want to do is to try to um, get across that empathy and put the reader in the perspective of these people and why they're really just trying to find anything that might help advance or win this war. They're throwing anything against the wall and just seeing what sticks. 
So from their perspective, in the back of their heads, they know some of this is outlandish. But you know what? Desperate times call for desperate measures. So if we have to resort to something outlandish to help the war, then that's what we're going to do. At least that's their, their perspective. Yeah, and that's really um, as you were as as you were talking about earlier with Stanley Lovell, like kind of his his evolution is kind of that mindset. It's like we got to do what we got to do to uh, mm-hmm. to win this war. Um, let's talk about the glowing foxes. <laughs> yeah, this is called Operation Fantasia. This is the brainchild of a man named Ed Salinger in the OSS. He was a businessman who had, before the war, done business in Tokyo. So he knew Japanese culture. He understood a lot of practices and rituals and religious customs of the Japanese, in the Shinto religion especially. That's why he was useful to the OSS, because they thought that he could help us, you know, plot psychological warfare against the Japanese. So he's recruited into the OSS. And Ed Salinger comes up with this idea to demoralize the Japanese. Um, the idea being, if they're demoralized, they'll be less willing to fight and maybe they'll give up the war sooner. And so his plan to do this involves glowing foxes. This relates to kind of a notion within the Shinto religion called kitsune. Kitsune are these animal-shaped spirit beings. And apparently within Shinto, if you see one of these things, it can be a bad omen. It could be kind of a portent of doom. If I see one of these glowing animals, it represents that something bad is going to happen to me. And so Salinger wanted to capitalize off this by creating glowing foxes. You know, these kitsune are typically glow. So he wants to create glowing foxes, release them in Japan. The idea being if the Japanese see them, they're going to mistake them for a real kitsune. And they're going to think this is a bad omen. It must be referring to the fact that we're going to lose this war. We might as well give up now while, you know, before we lose too many people. And so this actually gets surprisingly far. (laughs) The first Salinger he suggests that they just create whistles that sound like foxes and you know we'll get some people in japan to blow these whistles and they'll think it's these kitsune well you know there's several problems with this for one do people really know what foxes sound like are they really going to understand you know so that doesn't go over well he then suggests that they create fox odors something that smells like a fox so they'll you know the japanese will smell this and think oh the, you know these are the kitsune it's a bad omen but it's the same problem who knows what a fox smells like do people really know that so that doesn't go anywhere then he realizes the way to go forward with this, with this, as outlandish as it seems, is to capture live foxes, paint them with glowing radioactive paint from the American Radiation Cor- Radium Corporation, and then release them in Japan. And so that's what is basically done. They're not eventually re- released in Japan, but the experiments go surprisingly far. Several foxes are captured, and there are a couple experiments done with them. Um, one of the most interesting is to see whether the glowing paint actually stays on a fox because to get these foxes in Japan, they're probably going to be have to re- be released close to shore and swim to shore. You can't just go to Japan or release them. They're at war. So can foxes even swim? Can they swim to shore? So to test this, several foxes were towed out into the Chesapeake Bay, painted with this glowing paint and thrown overboard. And it turns out they actually did swim. They swam to shore. So foxes do swim. But by the time they had reached the shore, all the paint had washed off. So that didn't, you know, that didn't really work well. Another one of these experiments for Operation Fantasia was to get about 30 foxes and release them in Rock Creek Park. right around. This is DC. the one I thought was wild. <laughs> yeah, in Rock Creek Park. And th- the idea being, we've got these glowing foxes. And if they scare Americans, well, it's certainly going to scare the Japanese. So we can get kind of a test run to see if they're actually spooky. So these foxes are released in Rock Creek Park, and there are reports afterwards by newspapers that it really did scare people. They saw these apparitions, ghostly-like apparitions in the forest, and then the paper said that these people had the screaming genies upon seeing these foxes. So apparently this was a success. Hey, if it scared these Americans, it's really going to get the Japanese. But again, Operation Fantasia doesn't end up going into production in, in use in Japan. But there's another, kind of the most Probably the most interesting document I came across when doing research for this book involves Operation Fantasia. Ed Salinger, when he's doing these experiments with the R&D branch, the OSS, and trying to think of how to really demoralize the Japanese, he remembers a, a, a tale from Shinto in Japan that talks about the worst portents of doom are fox-shaped beings that have what he called you know, death's head upon them. And by this, they mean like a human skull, a skull upon their, their head. And so he comes up with this idea to taxidermy a fox, to paint it with his glowing paint, 
to get a human skull and attach it to the fox to make it seem as if it's got this, you know, death mark, and then to have a mechanical a mechanism that raises and lowers the jaw of this human skull, and they're going to project audio to make it seem as if this fox with a human skull is talking to the Japanese, telling them to lay down their arms and, you know, give up this war. Then they're going to attach this whole thing to a balloon to make it seem as if it's floating around so all the Japanese are going to be able to see it. So it's just completely crazy. But this so is a, I, I could, couldn't believe it when I saw the document explaining this. Oh, my gosh, this is actually a real thing. Yeah. And, you know, I, um, I, I, I found myself wondering, what was the fixation with everybody and animals? Because it, it wasn't just, frankly, it wasn't just the OSS. Uh, you write about how I think both the Soviets and the British we're stuffing rats full of um, explosives and like putting them in German coal mines and stuff like that. Um, what was yeah. this? Why, why were animals always, um, uh, That's a why good did they question. get so much focus? Yeah. I, I, I don't know why animals specifically, but they certainly do. You know, so yeah. you, you mentioned these rat bombs. This is a, a, a British invention, the SOE, the special operations executive. This is kind of the analog to the OSS and in, in, for the British. And so the idea behind the rat, rat, rat bombs is that you'll get a taxidermied rat, you'll stuff it full of explosives and sew it up, and you'll throw it into a coal reserve, like a German coal reserve. The idea being the Germans, when they shovel this coal into their boiler of their locomotives, their trains, they're not really going to, if they see a rat, they're not going to pick it up and throw it out. They're just going to shovel it in too because it's already there. And so this explosive rat, if they shovel it in, it's going to blow up in the flames and it's going to destroy this locomotive. So there were bat bombs that I talked about. There are rat bombs. There's also the idea of a cat bomb. So any variation of at bomb, it's got everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and the cat bomb, I think that was like cats getting dropped from planes to like guide missiles, right? Wasn't yeah, that? This, this, uh, so uh, in, in defense of the R&D branch, Stanley Lovell knew that this was not going to work. He knew that this was a stupid idea. But there was a senator in the United States who thought that it was a good idea. And when the senator is telling you to pursue something, Stanley Level didn't really think that he could, you know, say no. I mean, if you want to keep your funding coming from Congress, well, you better please Congress. So he feels pressure to pursue, to at least, he knows it's not going to work, but he at least does a quick test to prove that it doesn't. The idea of this cat bomb is that cats don't like water. And so they're naturally going to seek land. So if you drop a cat from the air, from like an airplane, it's naturally going to try to land on a ship because it doesn't want to hit the water. So what if you just attach a bomb to this cat and you drop it? it then it's like a seeking missile because it's going to avoid the water and hit the, hit the boat. And that doesn't make any sense from a physics perspective, but this senator really insisted this is going to help the war. So they had to do an experiment, and obviously it didn't work. Yeah, and it should be noted, too, that, that came from – this was – honestly, this is like the, 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 the biggest mistake was this came from like a public uh, uh, appeal – being like just out to everybody in the United States, send us your ideas for um, weapons that we could build to win this war. And so they just get like all these outlandish ideas. I think you talk about um, Stanley Lovell or, or maybe William Donovan just getting like uh, harassed with people wanting wanting them to hear their ideas that they know are bad ideas, um, but they've just got like kind of this this influx of people wanting to 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 help out, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is, this is one of Donovan's um, projects during the war, to try to recruit as many ideas as he can. I mean, why not tap into this inventive American spirit, he thinks. So he puts out a call to American inventors to send in your proposals for ideas. And, you know, if they're any good, then we'll try to pursue them. They'll be passed on to Stanley Level, for instance, and he'll develop them. Um, so a lot of these ideas are somewhat outlandish. Actually, the, the bat bomb actually comes from this kind of thing, too. Little Adams is a dentist, and he submits this proposal. He had the kind of connections to Eleanor Roosevelt, which is why it gets pursued a little bit more. But yeah, the cat, the cat bomb originates from that. There, there are several others. Not many of them are actually pursued. It was just kind of, you know, just kind of random people. There, there are several um, proposals for death rays and all kinds of stuff that, you know, obviously we're just well, we've you know we've talked about like some of like the these crazy these crazy ideas that obviously never were were used. What were some of the the dirty tricks that were actually used and did actually help the war effort? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there are a couple things to keep in mind with the things that were really useful. 
The first one is that this R&D branch that I'm talking about of the OSS, it's really composed of three different divisions make up this R&D branch. One division is, um, its, it's purpose is to create the weapons and devices like silenced pistols and explosives and all like the bat bomb and all that. That's the weapons kind of division. Another division is the documents division. Its purpose is to create all the forged passports and train tickets and ration tickets and all of that that an undercover agent might need when they're going abroad to spy or sabotage. Them. And then the last division is the camouflage division. This division was in charge of providing the disguises for these undercover agents, making sure they had authentic clothing and cover stories and all that. So I would say these last two divisions, the documents division and the camouflage division, these were the most useful. These were the most useful because it allowed agents to go abroad and gather this intelligence that otherwise probably wouldn't have been gathered. And then that intelligence could be sent to the United States where it can be used to make informed decisions on the war. So I think that's probably the most useful parts of this R&D branch. Another useful part of the documents and camouflage division, it allows these agents to go abroad where they train resistance forces. So they're undercover as a, just a, they're a civilian or something in France would say, and they train resistance forces who then sabotage the Germans. So I think those two divisions are probably the most useful. However, there are some very useful devices that the R&D branch creates. It's not just bat bombs and glowing foxes. Those are some of the exciting stories, but there are actually some useful things. Um, one of the most useful, I think, is probably an invention called the mole. The mole is this light-sensitive explosive device. The idea being that a saboteur could attach this little device to a train. And when the train moves into a tunnel, the device notices a sudden shift from light to dark. And that shift triggers the explosive, so it, it, it blows up. Now, the usefulness of this is that the train is derailed, and so it, it you know el eliminates this, let's say, German train, but also it plugs up the tunnel so no other trains can get through. Well, that's very useful. There are a lot of variations of this kind of thing. There are devices that can be dropped into like an oil intake pipe of a, a tank or a car, and it will destroy the engine. So those were used throughout France and Germany against the Germans. There's another explosive device um, or invention called Aunt Jemima. Aunt Jemima is a, a fairly well-known device that's created by this R&D branch, but it's basically flour. It looks like flour. You can bake it. You can eat it. You know, it can be made into cupcakes or cookies or muffins or whatever. But within this uh, flour is some explosive material. And so you can bake it and do everything with it. But if you set a specific charge to it, it'll blow up. The thing about Aunt Jemima, which made it very useful, is that you can sneak it into enemy territory pretty much undetected. If anyone's bringing flour somewhere, no one's really going to suspect that they're carrying explosives. So the fact that the flour itself is the explosive is what made it really useful because it was disguised. Now, who are the people who are actually on the ground? Uh, is the OSS sending people from Washington to carry out these operations? Are these people in the army? Who's, who's, who's doing the sabotage? Yeah, so they, they are recruiting people. A lot of the people that the OSS recruits are um, foreigners. So people who are fluent in, in whatever language, wherever they're going, and who actually know the geography and maybe even have contacts that they can help to train these resistance forces. So there are a lot of foreign recruits who are used as undercover agents for the OSS. There are Americans, though, that are trained and then sent abroad, especially to sabotage and spy on, let's say, the Germans. And in order to train these recruits from the U.S., there's a, the OSS set up a training school called Area F. This was, this was on the grounds of the Congressional Country Club, this, you know, nice golf course and everything. The OSS kind of took over those grounds during World War II, and that's where it had a training school for all these agents. So they learned how to pick locks. They learned how to discreetly open and close letters. They learned how to set explosives and all kinds of stuff. And, um, yeah, I, I tell one story at the beginning of the book. This is Roger Hall, who wrote this uh, a book on the OSS, a famous kind of memoir called You're Stepping on My Cloak and Dagger. It's very humorous. Um, but he, he talks about the last test that you have to take at training school for the OSS to become one of these agents is to break into an American defense plant and steal secret information to prove that you actually learned something. And if you get caught, well, you fail your test. So it's very simple. You either don't get caught or you get caught. So Roger Hall goes into one of these plants and he, 
he has a cover story that he's this war hero who's just come back and he was injured in war and he's now a journalist and he's reporting on whatever and he's seeking a job at this defense plant. Could you please give me a tour around so I can talk to some people? When really he wants the tour so he can see what they're making and get you know information and so he can show the OSS, look, I did really good. I gathered all this information from this what's supposed to be secret place. So he he goes. He the person who's interviewing him at the beginning is this young woman who's smitten by him because he tells her this war story. He's this war hero and you know blah blah blah. She ends up being the vice president's daughter of the company. So she gets Roger Hall an interview with the vice president the next day. Roger Hall goes. He makes a great impression on the vice president who invites him to lunch. At lunch, the vice president it's in the plant cafeteria. The vice president walks up to, to the stage in front of the room and he says to everyone, unbeknownst to Roger Hall, we've got someone here from abroad who just came back and he wants to tell you his story. So, you know, come up here. Of course, Roger Hall is not ready for this. He, he's made all of it up. He doesn't know what's going on. So he starts limping to the stage because remember, he's supposed to have been injured in the war. So he develops his limp. And so he goes to the stage and he puts on the show of his life. He starts saying that, you know, I've been... Uh, with these hardened men abroad and when mail call comes around, they don't get any letters. So you need to write letters to these guys and you need to buy war bonds and all this stuff. He gets a standing ovation. He limps off the stage. The vice president is shaking his right hand. The, you know, his daughter is clinging to Roger Hall's left hand. Um, it's printed up in newspapers afterwards, this great speech by this American war hero. And he's offered the job and he never returns because he had passed his OSS. test. <laughs> Yeah, I thought that was, I remember reading that. And I think the thinking was that like, oh, this will just, this will be helpful for both um, the OSS, but also the FBI. We'll, we'll help them, you know, learn how to, uh, to, to catch spies. But yeah, I, the, I remember. The FBI, re yeah. the FBI did not like this. The fact that the OSS is telling its recruits in order to pass, you basically have to steal information because that made the FBI look really bad because you're not protecting these secretive places. But Donovan, the head of the OSS, basically said, well, it's good training for both of us. So I'm going to continue doing it. Yeah, that, that, that story made me uh, chuckle a little bit. Uh, also, the story that you write later on in the book about um, when, um, when we're talking about um, truth. Um, I don't know if you want to call it a serum or, mm -hmm. you know. Um, yeah, truth drugs. Yeah. Truth drugs. Yeah. Um, where they, they put like this truth drug in into cigarettes and um, there's an interrogator and then like a German submarine captain who's being interrogated mm -hmm. and he accidentally switches up the cigarette so that it's supposed to be the interrogator is smoking a, a normal cigarette, but the person mm -hmm. who's being interrogated, the German smokes this like truth drug. Well, he, he flips it on accident and he start, he smokes the truth drug cigarette and he starts going off about like how much he hates his commander. And, like, <laughs> really just like, and I, when I was reading it, I was imagining just like the scene in that room where like this guy who's being this German who's being interrogated it's like, what is going on right now? <laughs> yeah, the, the, the idea with these truth drugs, um, the, the idea is that this would be great for interrogations. If you could give someone that's guaranteed that, let's say, the creative parts of their mind were somehow prevented from acting, then the only thing that they could say, they can't imagine anything because their creative parts have been tampered down. The only thing they can say is the truth because they have no ability to create lies. That's at least the idea. It, it doesn't end up working in practice like that. That's the idea. But some of these truth drugs, um, they do actually lower inhibition. So one of the main truth drugs that the OSS Stanley level is experimenting with is THC acetate, which THC is the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana. So it, it actually does lower inhibition. But this really isn't anything new. I mean, people have known for thousands of years that alcohol lowers inhibition. There's this phrase by Pliny the Elder thousands of years ago, in vino veritas. So in wine lies the truth. So if you can get someone drunk, well, their inhibitions are lowered and they're more likely to tell you stuff they wouldn't otherwise. So the truth drugs don't actually work out in practice in that they guarantee you get the truth. But there were experiments done by the OSS that showed it actually sometimes can get people to talk more, but you can't guarantee that what they say is true. Yeah, so yeah, but there are a lot of truth drug experiments going on with the OSS too. Let's talk about the atomic bomb. Um, um, because obviously that is like the dirty trick that, um, I mean, you know, for the purposes of your book, mm -hmm. uh, the, the dirty trick that wins the war, 
um, or adds to winning the war. Um, what was the OSS's involvement in advancing the atomic bomb? The, the OSS isn't involved too much in actually creating the bomb. The main thing that the OSS is involved in, in related to atomic bombs, is that there are several attempts to make sure that the Germans aren't creating an atomic bomb. Well, I guess there's, there, there's one other thing. Speaking of these truth drugs, um, there are experiments on personnel that are working on the Manhattan Project with truth drugs. So the Manhattan Project is the American effort to build an atomic bomb. And when the OSS is developing these truth drugs, um, it wants to test it on people who have real secrets to hide. And so it gets people from the Manhattan Project and it gives them these truth drugs to try to see whether they'll actually reveal what they're working on. Um, in most instances, it just causes them to get sick and throw up, you know, but that, that was, that was the, uh, the experiment at least. But with the, with the German atomic bomb, the OSS, one of the main things it does is try to make sure that they, the Germans are not creating one. So pretty much everyone knew. If you, if you were a physicist at this time and you knew about atomic bombs at least, you knew that out of anyone who's going to be creating a German atomic bomb or at least leading their program, it's going to be Werner Heisenberg. He's the main guy. He's the world famous renowned physicist. If anyone is leading a German atomic bomb project, it's going to be him. And so there were a few efforts within the OSS that Stanley Lovell helped advise on to either kidnap or assassinate Werner Heisenberg. I go into these in some detail in the book. One is to recruit a guy, a former professional baseball player named Mo Berg. Mo Berg is assigned, well, Mo Berg is recruited to the OSS because he is a polyglot. He spoke several different languages, which is very useful for an organization like the OSS. So he's recruited, and he's basically told to attend a lecture by Werner Heisenberg in Switzerland. And if it seems like he's talking about nuclear fission or something related to atomic bombs, to literally pull out a pistol and shoot him and assassinate him right there. That's Berg's assignment. So he goes to Switzerland, he sits in on this lecture, and he, he kind of gets the impression that Werner Heisenberg isn't, you know, working on atomic bombs, so he doesn't assassinate him. But that's kind of the OSS's main connection to atomic bombs, is that it's trying to prevent the atomic bombs from being created in Germany. Yeah, and I think, too, if I remember correctly, before um, the goal was to assassinate Heisenberg, they actually wanted to kidnap him and bring him to America, but the Manhattan Project had, had progressed, so... They didn't yeah, see so, any yeah. One, one of the one of the guys who's tasked with this is someone named Carl Eichler. He was the head of what's called Detachment 101 in Burma. He's trying to destroy a Japanese airbase, but he gets recalled to the United States and assigned basically this task of kidnapping Werner Heisenberg before Moberg is put on the on the assassination kind of scheme. Um, the problem with Carl Eichler is that he was extremely loud and gregarious and rambunctious and. He was very similar to Donovan in a lot of ways, but with even less of a filter. Um, so when you want to kidnap someone like Werner Heisenberg, this, is a, this should be a quiet, delicate affair where you kidnap him. And that's kind of the opposite of Carl Eifler. So he's eventually called off that. And that's when Mo Berg gets assigned to assassin Werner Heisenberg. Uh, so let's talk about, I know we, we touched on this at the beginning of the show, um, but let's talk a little bit about the, the moral aspect to all of these dirty tricks. Um, give us kind of a, a, an overview. This com- becomes more of a question when you write about biological and, and chemical weapons, but throughout the book, you know, the, the experimentation on animals, um, you know, there, there are questions and Stanley Lovell, um, as you mentioned, he does have kind of an arc. Talk about the the moral dilemma to the scientists working on these experiments, and then specifically with Stanley Lovell. Mm-hmm. Stanley Lovell, like I said, he at the beginning of the war, he's reluctant to work on any of this. By the end of the war, he's advocating for the use of chemical and biological weapons. And that arc can really be kind of explained in his familiarity with what war is. When he became more familiar with the gruesome nature of just conventional warfare, he decided the ethical thing is to end the war as soon as possible by whatever means necessary. To prolong the war, even if it means not using biological or chemical weapons, to prolong the war would be unethical to him. So he's advocating to end the war as soon as possible. If it means we have to resort to biological weapons, then so be it. It means that we're going to overall save lives. Now, he doesn't really, he doesn't really engage with the 
kind of arguments against that position, like the precedent that it's going to set for future wars or anything like that. In his mind, we are at war right now, and we want to end it as soon as possible. Now, he actually takes this even further by arguing that, say, biological weapons might be the ethical alternative to conventional warfare. And he gives kind of a thought experiment explaining why this might be the case. In conventional warfare, let's say you stab someone with a bayonet. Well, they're probably going to die by, they're going to get an infection, and it's going to kill them, and it's going to be gruesome the entire time. Stanley Lovell's argument is, what if we can just give, that, then give them the infection without stabbing them with a bayonet? You know, so they're going to die of an infection either way, through a biological weapon or through an infection. Well, if they're going to die by the infection either way, why not spare them the gruesome wound? You know, isn't this the ethical thing to do? This is at least the gears that are turning in Stanley Lovell. So what is it that, that, that makes, that sparks that change for him? One of the main things is that Stanley Lovell has a son. There's a real personal aspect to this. Stanley Lovell's son is on a boat midway across the Pacific waiting to engage in an invasion of Japan. And the sooner the war ends, the better the chance that Stanley Lovell's son doesn't die. And so Stanley Lovell is saying, if we end this war as soon as possible, not, not only is it going to save his son, it's going to save all these people, but there's really a personal dimension to this. Yeah. Well, what's your assessment of of Stanley Lovell's, well, I guess, you know, what's Stanley Lovell's legacy and, and what's your assessment of that legacy? This is one of the most interesting things that I was trying to do at the end of this book. I, I knew of Stanley Lovell and, you know, I had been researching his life and, and work during the OSS and I couldn't help but constantly make comparisons to the Cold War when the CIA is doing a lot of similar stuff. During the Cold War in the 1950s especially, the CIA had launched a program called MKUltra. This is kind of an infamous program in CIA history. MKUltra is, the purpose was to see if mind control is possible. Is it possible to control people, to make them tell the truth, to potentially make them assassinate others? This, this is the idea. Using drugs or hypnosis or some other means. The leader of this MKUltra program is a guy named Sidney Gottlieb, who is also a chemist. And... As I was researching Stanley Lovell, I couldn't help but draw connections between him and Sidney Gottlieb. They seemed very similar. Both had worked in the R&D branch, basically, of their intelligence organization. Both had been involved in developing weapons and disguises and documents and devices. Both had been involved in developing assassination plots on foreign leaders. Both had been involved in truth drug experiments. And so I, think, I, I was thinking, their careers are so similar. and you know, that, that's not enough. That wasn't enough for me to, to want to talk about Sidney Gottlieb too much. But I thought in the back of my head, maybe there's some connection between them. Maybe it's not a coincidence that their careers were so similar. And so I was constantly looking for any kind of connection there might be between Stanley Lovell and Sidney Gottlieb. And I'm pleased to say that I found connections between them. For one, one of the people that Stanley Lovell hired to do these truth drug tests for the OSS during World War II is a guy named George White. George White was a Bureau of Narcotics officer, but he had connections to a lot of criminals. And so that's why Stanley Lovell hired him during World War II so that he could test these truth drugs on all these criminals. Well, during the Cold War, Sidney Gottlieb is working on truth drugs as well for the CIA, for this MK Ultra program. And who does he hire to test these drugs? Well, he's looking through the OSS files and he sees the name of George White. He hires the very same George White because his OSS files basically served as his resume. Now, there were a couple of other connections that I found. I had found these incredible depositions that Sidney Gottlieb was forced to give in the 1980s. After all this is over, uh, several victims of MKUltra sue the CIA, and Sidney Gottlieb is forced to give depositions. And I was going through these depositions in the archives. I was taking pictures really quickly just of them. You know, I didn't have time to read them in the archives. I just wanted to take pictures and get out of there so I could analyze them later. And the archive, I wanted to gather as much material as possible. So I'm there. I'm taking pictures of these depositions. And I thought, wouldn't it be great if, you know, he talks about Stan Stanley Lovell in here, if he, if he mentions the OSS, and then I could really make some concrete connection between Stanley Lovell and Sidney Gottlieb. So I'm taking pictures. I'm going through these. And then... On one page, I see the name Stanley Lovell. Stanley Lovell is right there in the dialogue that Sidney Gottlieb is talking about. And again, I'm in the archive 
only for a short period of time. So I couldn't stop and read it. I just had to take a picture and move on. But I knew that it was in there somewhere. And so I'll kind of leave this as a teaser to the reader. If you want to know what Sidney Gottlieb and Stanley Lovell's connection is, you're going to have to read the book. But rest assured that I found some connection in those depositions. But, you know, I say all that to say one of Stanley Lovell's lasting legacies, you know, he, he has a, an important legacy during World War II for helping develop some of these documents and disguises and weapons. His real consequential legacy, not that he intended this to be the case, was inspiring a new generation of scientists in the CIA to do similar kinds of stuff that he was doing during World War II. And that led to some really, in many cases, unfortunate consequences, like with this MK Ultra program. He was kind of the direct inspiration for this to happen. Oh, well, um, you've 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 teed it up. So you know, to find more, you got to pick up the book. You got to <laughs> yeah, you, you got to read it. Flip it open. Uh, by the way, I don't know if you were talking about being in the doing your research in the National Archives, but um, I've also so I've done research in the National Archives, and I've had a similar situation. They're, they they close like I I think at like five, and I've got like this whole like stack of stuff in front of me and I've got this like image scanner and I'm like there's like 10 minutes to go and I'm just like quickly like all right just scan all this stuff when I get home like I'll, I'll take a look at it but I'm kind of like sweating bullets and then I see something that really jumps out at me I'm like oh I gotta read this and then like I it's a real problem for me frankly I've been to the National Archives a few times I don't know if you uh, similarly have had a an issue yeah yeah um the, the National Archives is notoriously difficult because you have to go through so many steps in order to get the material, which I guess makes sense. It's like, you know, important material, but you've got to, you know, submit your thing. And then if, it, if it's classified or if it's been declassified, you have to go get a little number on in each picture. It has to show the number showing that this is declassified. And you have to, you know, go through all kinds of steps. It's so cumbersome. You know, there, there's the a range thing. of experiences in the archives. In the National Archives, it's like the most intensive I've experienced. There are other archives, I won't name them, but you go to and I, you know, you say something like, oh, I'm interested in the papers of, you know, ex scientists, whoever it is. And they just bring you a box and they say, okay, have fun. See you in a bit. <laughs> and you have free reign to do all these documents. So, I, I mean, I prefer the latter because it gives me access and, you know, uh, it's, it's a little easier to get these documents. Yeah, the National Archives is pretty intense though. Well, uh, John, this has been a great interview. Um, I, like I said, I really enjoyed your book. Um, I hope people um, uh, read about all these very fascinating, dirty tricks that were used during World War II. Um, what are you working on next? Yeah, I, I'm fortunate. I've got a grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities, and it's going to help me write a project that pretty much takes off where this one ends. So this one, as I mentioned, ends talking about the connection between Stanley Lovell and Sidney Gottlieb. The next one is really going to focus on MK Ultra, describing these experiments. I found incredible documents, you know, of, I'll, I'll leave it for that project, but incredible documents that's gonna, that I'm going to be using to describe what's happening under MK Ultra. But then I'm going to carry that even further in this next project to talk about these victims that sue the CIA and how the CIA is kind of interacting and responding and challenging these victims. So it's, it's about MK Ultra, but it's also about this pursuit of justice. So that's what the next project is going to be. All right. Well, I hope you come back on the show and, and uh, when you write your, your next book and talk about I'd it. I'd love to. Yeah, thanks for having me. <laughs> yeah. Well, where can people find you? Are you on social media? If somebody wants to follow you, where can people get in touch? Sure. The, the probably easiest place is Twitter. If you go to at John Lyle, J-O-H-N-L-I-S-L-E, that's my Twitter handle. I don't post too much, but you know, if you want to keep up with updates about me, that's where I'll post you know, book updates or anything like that. And also kind of a plug for following me is that I, you know, I try to keep my feed very entertaining. So most of what I post is actually just pictures from the archives of documents, incredible documents that I've found. So if you want to see firsthand what it's like to be a historian in the archives, looking for documents and coming across kind of gems, then follow my Twitter feed. And that's where I post interesting, you know, archival finds. Oh, great. I'll follow your Twitter feed. That sounds really cool. <laughs> All right. Thanks. <laughs> All right. Well, um, John, thanks so much again. Um, check out John's book, uh, The Dirty Tricks Department, Stanley Level, The OSS in the Masterminds of World War II Secret Warfare. Uh, go pick up a copy. Go check it out from the library. Uh, a lot of really fascinating stuff in it. 
And John, thanks again for your time.